Okay, in this video we're going to take a uh, just a quick look at a review, if you like, of some of the control system stuff. So in Engineering 101 we talked a little bit about open and closed loop systems. Um, we talked about open loop systems being toasters or fireworks, essentially set and release systems that you have no control over and that don't have any way about finding their current state. Closed loop systems, by contrast, are systems that have some feedback mechanism of getting information about their current state and can respond to that and the one that you're probably most familiar with is the PID control that you implemented and used as part of the autonomous vehicle challenge in engineering 101. <coughs> Now, finite state machines are another kind of control system, and we've talked about those in the context of traffic lights and things, but they do also work very well as control systems for a variety of other scenarios as well. But I want to go back to, to PID for a moment, because while we talked about PID and a general uh, closed loop system being set up diagrammatically, as you can see in front of you, with your controller having proportional components, integral components, and derivative components, um, and then you we sent you a way to implement those, we didn't actually show you how to calculate them by hand. And if you don't know how to do that, it can be quite tricky to see how they evolve over time, and in particular how they respond to time. So let, let's take a look. Let's start with proportional. So here's an example exam question from a couple of years ago. Uh, we've got an example error signal coming out on our graph, and we've been asked to calculate what the proportional component of that error signal is, given a value for kp. Now doing that is actually very, very simple, so let's go through and, and do it. Essentially what we're going to do is we're going to look at each point and we're going to calculate the error component at that point. So starting off with this point here. So I'm going to indicate this by at time equals zero. Um, our current error value, our E, is zero and so our proportional component for that will simply by be zero times, uh, sorry, zero times kp, which in this case is 1.5, which is zero. So that means our error signal at time zero is also zero. So I can draw it on my plot as that little blue dot there. Now let's try it for a more interesting example. Let's do it at uh, time equals 0.2. At 0.2, my error signal, if I read it off this graph here, it looks around about the number 12 to me. And so my proportion is going to be, instead of 0 now, it's going to be 12 times 1.5. Um, and that will be that product there, uh, which is going to be 18, if I do that math correctly in my head, uh, that is going to be my proportional value at t equals 0.2 seconds. And I can draw that on my graph as well, uh, it's going to be up here. Now if I do it for my next one, at t equals 0.4, my error is, that looks, I'm going to call that 15, just to make this next bit a little bit easier for me. Um, no, I'm going to call it 16, to make this next bit a little bit easier for me. And then so my P is going to be my proportional component, at that point is going to be 16 times 1.5, which is going to be 24 by my calculations. Um, and so once again, I can draw that on the graph up there and you can you can imagine I can keep going through and doing this for every single point along this chain now that'll be a bit dull but you can probably already see the pattern the proportional signal if I draw it out just roughly from here on will always follow the shape I'm oh, sorry let's get rid of that last bit um, will always follow the shape of the underlying signal but So the important thing being that my uh, proportional component will always follow the same shape as my underlying error signal at the same time. Now, if my KP, if it's above one, then my proportional component will be larger than my error signal. If my KP is below one, then my um, proportional component will be lower than my error signal. But the general shape will always be the same. Okay. So with that in mind, let's look at a different response. Let's look at the integral response, because this may not always follow the underlying shape, because it doesn't just depend on what the current error is, it depends on the current error plus the sum of all the previous errors. 
So what you can see again from here is that we're starting at zero. So I'm going to skip that zero point, and we're going to start this time at oh sorry, right on the screen. Um, we're going to start at time equals zero point two. So my error signal that's point two I said was twelve, and so that means that my uh, integral is going to be uh, zero plus. 12 times whatever my ki is times 0.1 so this is going to give me uh, 1.2 in this case and if I draw this my integral would be a little blue dot down there on this graph if I look at the, the scaling so again not super interesting so let's take a look at the next point and see what happens so 0 0.4 my integral is the sum of all the errors up to this point so 0 plus 12 plus um, 0 plus 12 plus 16 times 0.1 which is if I sum that up that's going to be 28 times 0.1 so it's going to be 2.8 um, and my 2.8 is going to be just over half it's going to be somewhere around here and I can keep going and you'll see that this error grows much more slowly and in fact will still be positive when this point reaches down here at this point however the total error will start to reduce so let's take a look what would happen if I asked you to calculate it at this point down here so I'm gonna skip a few and go t what happens at t equals 1.4 well my integral oops is uh, 0 plus 12 plus 16 plus uh, 12 plus if I'm reading that off that's going to be let's say 7 plus 0 minus 4 minus 6 so now that I've gone under the 0 point you can see my error is actually reducing it's it's negative and so that will start to reduce from my total. So it's all of that times 0.1, and I can't do that in my head, so you have to calculate that out. But the point is that as we go, as we spend more time on one side of the axis, our error will build up more positively or more negatively, and that number, that sum, is how the integral response allows you to identify whether you spent a long time on one side of your target point or on the other. Now, just before we finish up, I want to deal with the derivative. Now, this is the most complicated one to calculate. Not because derivatives are complicated, they're not. We can take some nice simplifications and calculate them very easily, but because it depends on whether we're getting them in real time or whether we're looking at this in the past. So let's say for the moment, I've got all of this uh, data here, and I received it at some point in the past. So I, uh, I know this was the result and I'm calculating what is the derivative at each point. Well, I can't actually calculate what the derivative is here because this is a discontinuity. There is no derivative defined at that point. So I'm gonna skip, skip this one and I'm gonna start here. So when I say what is the derivative at that point, I'm really asking what is an approximate, an approximation of the slope at that point? And doing that is pretty simple. So let's go, let's go back, click my pen, uh, and let's go at this point here, at t equals 0 0.2 seconds. What is the value of my slope? So I could grab a ruler and try and draw it, and I think vaguely it should look something like that line there. But there is a more rigorous way of doing that. Essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the point in front of it and the point behind it, and I'm going to assume that the slope of this point is the slope between those two. That's, that process is called linearization. And yes, it is an assumption. Um, but let's try and figure it out. So we know that the slope of a line is the distance up divided by the distance across. Now the distance up there is 15 minus 0. So it's that point minus that point over the distance across, which is 0 0.4 minus 0. Zero. So we can obviously write that simpler as 15 divided by 
and that is going to be my derivative at 0.2 seconds. So to calculate what my derivative component will be is it will be 15 divided by 0 0.4, 0 0.4, sorry, times 0.5. Why times 0.5? Well, because my KD value up here is 0.5. Uh, and I can go ahead and do that for every other point along that line. All I do is I look at the points on either side of it, calculate the slope based on those two points, not the actual point itself, but the two points on either side, and then multiply that by my KD, and that will be my derivative response components. Now, this will get a little bit trickier if I'm getting this data in real time, because essentially, if I'm measuring at this point here, and I'm doing this in real time, I don't know what the error signal is going to be there. So in that case, instead of taking the points on either side, I take my current value and the previous value, difference between them, exactly the same process, and I calculate my derivative based off of that.